Good morning, students. Since about a, I'm about a lecture behind, what I have tried to do is combine two lectures, reheating and its effects on primary gravitational waves. And I had already described what reheating is. We have an inflationary potential, maybe any non-trivial potential. And inflation ends somewhere at phi n. This is V of phi. And the field oscillates at the bottom of the potential. And as you can imagine, as it oscillates at the bottom of the potential, the period during this epoch post-inflation will be determined by the manner in which fields or field oscillates at the bottom of the potential. And during this period, the energy from the inflaton is supposed to be transferred to radiation. And how do we achieve that? In the model that I will discuss, we will explicitly couple the energy densities of the inflaton and radiation, and we will see it is possible to transfer the energy to radiation. And in the later part of the talk, towards the very end, last 20 minutes or so, we will discuss the effects on the primary gravitational waves. We have seen, you know, we have arrived at the equation governing the gravitational waves. We have seen the mukhanov sasaki equation, for instance, for gravitational waves. It depends only on A double prime by A. So if I know the behavior of the scale factor post-inflation, then uh, I, in principle, can evolve um, the you know um, gravitational waves after inflation. They are seeded during inflation. Remember, these are the primary gravitational waves, and we will continue the revolution post-inflation into the radiation-dominated era. And we will, in particular, try to understand what is the spectrum or the, you know, or very small scales, k much, much greater than keq. Keq is of the order of 10 power minus 2 mega per second was until scales corresponding close to the end of inflation. That's the scope of today's lecture. So before we try to transfer the energy to radiation, we would like to know how the field behaves at the bottom of the potential. Ouch. Okay, how the field behaves at the bottom of the potential. And what we will do is as follows. We will try to average the field is exhibiting oscillations. So you can expect the energy density, you know, energy density is almost a constant until the end of inflation. Thereafter, you may expect it to fall, okay? Uh, of course, it depends on the form of the potential at the bottom, we will see. And uh, and uh, and what, what do you expect is that there will be a fall, but there'll be tiny oscillations superimposed on that. But we are not worried about those oscillations at this stage. We are interested in how it's falling. So we will average over the oscillations. So what do we have? We start with this equation, rho phi dot. We are assuming that we are in a stage. It is still dominated by the scalar field. So it is rho phi dot plus is 3h rho phi plus p phi equal to zero. Okay. And or rho phi dot is minus 3h. Remember what is rho phi and p phi? Rho phi is phi dot squared by 2 minus v. And p phi is uh, phi dot squared, oh, plus v minus v. So this is just 3h phi dot squared. Okay, right? Or I can write this as rho phi dot equal to, okay, minus 6h. Phi dot squared is evidently, um, okay, rho phi minus uh, 3, rho phi minus v phi. What is it? Um, phi dot squared is two, I'm sorry, 3h into two times rho phi minus v phi. Okay, this is what we have. This is an exact result. Now, what we are going to do is that, or this is 6h, okay, uh, or we are going to average this. Rho phi dot is what? Minus 6h rho phi minus v phi. Okay. All right, and the point is, what is this? Rho phi minus V phi average, okay? We are averaging over the oscillations over one time period. Tau is evidently the time period, dt, rho phi, okay, minus V of phi, okay? And what happens is that there is some maximum value, 
okay, some phi m minus phi m to plus phi m. And we are going to assume, what we are going to assume that, you know, at the minimum, at the minimum, V phi is proportional to some, is near, at, this is near the minimum, MPL power some N. That's what we are going to assume. Okay. So what do we have? I can write this integral in the following fashion, dt by d phi, d phi, because I would like to integrate over phi, phi m. This is phi dot, right? And then rho phi minus v phi. Okay. All right. And uh, so now phi dot is what? Square root of, okay, root 2 into rho phi minus v phi. That's what we have. Now divided by t, okay, what is it? I can write this as um, uh, dt, okay, um, dt, right, by d phi, d phi by phi dot. Is this correct? Okay, all right. And uh, so what will this become? Okay. And phi dot, I can again replace by 1 over, now square root of, there's a root 2 here. And then there should be a half here. I made an error here. This should be, you should have corrected me, right? No, this is correct. Okay. This is correct. This should be a half. And as a result, this becomes half. Okay, all right. So this becomes minus phi m to phi m, right? Okay, so this is essentially d, okay. dt is d phi by phi dot. That's what I have written. And phi dot I'm replacing with rho phi root two times rho phi minus v of phi. This is what it is. Now, what we are going to assume is that rho phi, okay, I am going to erase this. I hope I got to do it because I don't have space. I hope you will remember, okay? So rho phi, I'm going to assume to be some V phi n. It's oscillating about some, you know, the value of the field at phi m, okay? And so let me call this as Vn, all right, Vn. And in such a case, I can immediately calculate rho phi minus V of phi average to be the following integral minus phi m to plus n. Phi m, what do I have? Root two, root two goes away. So I don't need to worry about it. So I'm left with d phi, correct? One minus V phi by V m square root. All right divided by integral d phi by root b m power half minus phi to phi, phi m to phi m, d phi by square root of one minus v phi by v m. That's what I have, all right? Now, I presume you it's clear to you that it is, this has dimensions of, uh, um, uh, it has dimensions of, right? So there is a, no, there is a VM power half I have missed out, correct? So this will go away, this will go away. I'm sorry, this will combine to give this. And this is just a number, okay? This is just a number. It is alpha VM, okay? All right? And uh, which is like, alpha rho phi, okay? It's a crude approximation, okay? And alpha, you can show for the kind of potential that we had is n by n plus two, okay? It is, you can write the, carry out the integral in terms of, remember, we had a power law of potentials, okay? And you can carry out these integrals. I will leave this as an exercise to show that alpha is n by n plus two. Is that clear? Okay. So what we effectively have is as follows. Okay. 
what you effectively have is the following. You have rho phi dot equal to minus 6 H alpha rho phi. Okay. And uh, so if you write this as um, uh, if, if you had P phi equal to some W phi rho phi. Okay. What do you have then? I have um, rho phi dot equal to minus 3H into 1 plus W phi into rho phi. So clearly, 3H1 plus W5 is what? 6H alpha, which is N by N plus 2, right? 3H goes, this is 2, okay? So W5 equal to 2N by N plus 2 minus 1. So this is 2N minus N minus 2 by N plus 2, which is N plus 2. Sorry, n minus 2 by n plus 2. This is an important result. Okay. So what do we have in mind? We have this field which is oscillating at the bottom of the potential. Right. And we are averaged over the oscillations and determine what is the effective equation of state as the field is oscillating at, the, at this potential, at the bottom of the potential. And what we find is that, you know, there is only one parameter here. What is this n? Remember, we are assuming at the bottom of the potential, the field behaves like this, some MPL over n. Okay? And that is what has been substituted, carry, carry out this integral. I hope it's clear. It's some integral of the type, integral dx root of 1 minus x power n divided by integral dx by, the, the, I don't know why there are two d phi's here, okay? Um, by square root of one minus x power n. And that can be written in terms of gamma functions and you will find that alpha, okay? This alpha is n by n plus two. I will, I'm repeating myself. I've left this as an exercise. So what do you have? You have W phi equal leading to n W phi equal to n minus two by n plus two. So if you have a quadratic potential, you will hear this term you know, commonly said, if you have a quadratic potential, if the potential at the bottom behaves quadratically at the around the minima, then you have matter-like domin matter domination post-inflation. Okay. If you have a five-four potential, then you have it is uh, four minus two by four plus two. It's one third. It behaves like radiation. And when n is very large, okay, when n is very large, it behaves like a stiff fluid. Okay. We'll talk about that extreme, you know, uh, much later. Okay. Now, what we have understood is how the field behaves at the bottom of the potential. So you expect it is not difficult to understand, right? Rho phi at the bottom of the potential will behave like a power minus three into one plus w phi. Okay. That's how it will behave. That's how we calculated this n minus two by n plus two. Okay. And, but we would like to see you know, remember what I said, we want to transfer the energy from the inflaton to radiation. And in order to do so, I need to write down the equations governing the conservation of the stress energy tensor. Okay. And we would like to transfer the energy, but evidently we want to transfer the energy. We don't want to violate conservation of energy. Okay. We need to ensure that the total energy, some of the energies in the radiation and the scalar field is concerned. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. All right. So let's proceed to try transferring energy from the scalar field to radiation. So what is done is as follows. So if you want to transfer energy, okay, there should be something decaying away from the scalar field. And that should go into radiation. That's what we are expecting. Okay. So what do we have? Plus 3H rho plus P, rho phi plus P phi. Okay. 
equal to what we are going to do is include something for gamma phi phi dot square. I'll check the there is a minus, okay, which means that it will come to this side, okay. Uh, I can write phi dot squared as rho phi minus p phi, right? Just give me a minute, right? Okay, minus k minus gamma phi phi dot squared, okay? But we know this is phi dot squared, okay? Gamma is some constant, okay? Gamma is some constant. That's what we are assuming. And it is that gamma phi phi dot squared, which is going to drain the energy from the scalar field, okay? So what do I have? I have rho phi dot, okay, plus 3h plus gamma phi, right? Phi dot squared equal to zero. That's what I have, okay? And I can write this as rho phi dot plus 3h, okay, plus gamma phi, phi dot squared, okay, which is rho phi minus b phi. Equal to zero, right? But, you know, now we're going to average this. We're going to average this over a time period like we had done earlier. And what we have, in, it is clear when we average over, okay, that there is a decay of the energy. Correct? But not only do you, you know, th that's due to the expansion. I hope it's clear. But we want the energy to drain and transfer elsewhere. Okay? We will, I will illustrate how it, you know, it drains from the scalar field and it's transferred to radiation. Notice this has been introduced by hand. Okay? And if it is the only field in the universe, there is a problem. It will decay, you know, it will, this is not energy conservation equation. Now, what we will do is that we will write a similar equation for the conservation of the energy density of radiation and add the negative of the term on the right-hand side. So, the total energy of rho r and rho phi is conserved. Okay? All right? And we will come to the radiation in a matter of minutes. Okay? But before that, let's solve this equation. As I said, I'm going to average. Okay? What's going to happen? I know what's going to happen when I average. So, I will get, you know... I have assumed it is average, but I'm not including the notation. So what will I have? If I take it to the right-hand side, it will give me minus, no, there is something not correct, okay? This should be two, no, phi dot squared, it is two times. Is that correct? Right? Phi dot squared is two times rho phi minus V phi, okay? So I will get minus six, okay? This is just going to be alpha 6h alpha rho phi, right? Minus 2 alpha gamma phi rho phi. So I can divide by rho phi on both sides. Okay. So what's going to happen? This will go away. Okay. And as you may have guessed, what will happen is that, so if I integrate this, right? If I integrate this, right, okay, if I integrate this, what will I get? I will get log rho phi, okay, is, this is d rho phi by dt, and there will be a dt, so I can write this. This is A dot by A. So this is DA by A. This is, I'm sorry. And then there will be a DT here. Is that clear? So log rho phi minus 6 alpha log A, right? Minus 2 alpha gamma phi, sorry, gamma phi times T. Okay? Or rho phi is going to be some rho n phi. What is rho n phi? This is the energy density at the end of inflation. We are assuming that it is oscillating about phi n. Okay? And then A by A e power minus 6 alpha. This is this term. And then e power minus 2 alpha 
gamma phi. Okay, some to be precise, some initial condition P minus T. So that T equal to T E rho phi is rho E phi, which is the energy density of the scalar field at the end of inflation. Okay, so in addition to this behavior, there is a decay of the energy density of the scalar field. And where does it go? It goes into radiation and we will achieve this transfer of energy into radiation uh, by adding the corresponding term in the, in the equation governing the energy density of radiation. So let me, what do I have? I have the following. So I have rho r dot plus 3h rho r plus pr equal to zero would have been the energy density for radiation alone, but I need to ensure that this term is present phi dot square. Is that clear? All right. And, and that is nothing but, you know, I can write this right term as, okay, two gamma phi rho phi minus V of phi, right? And as earlier, I can replace this as two. This is average of this is um, two alpha gamma phi rho phi. So I have to solve this equation plus three H. Sorry. Now this is uh, this is PR is rho R by three. So what do I have? I have four H rho R equal to this expression. Okay. And I know the solution for rho phi. I need to plug this in and ask what happens. Have I made an error? It's, uh, this is uh, one plus one third, it's four thirds. Okay, all right, is that clear? Okay, now what I'm going to do is that in order to solve this, I'm gonna write rho r as some rho r at the end of inflation, a by a e per four minus four, okay, times f of t. I hope it's clear. You know, what is going to happen is that this will be the behavior in the absence of this term, okay? And this f of t will be determined by this term. And what you will obtain is a differential equation, a first order differential equation for f of t, and that proves to be the following. Okay, that proves to be the following. F dot, okay, right? Okay, so what you obtain is, um, right, you substitute that, okay? Uh, just give me a minute. So what you obtain is that, okay, you obtain a differential equation for F dot that happens to be two alpha gamma phi, sorry, gamma phi by rho R E, okay? A by A E power four plus four, okay? Rho phi E, A by A E power minus six alpha, okay? Into E power minus gamma alpha gamma phi, sorry, T minus T, okay? All right, this is what you obtain. And you can immediately obtain f of t, integrate this to obtain f of t, okay? And f of t will be as follows, is two alpha gamma phi divided by rho r e, rho phi e, okay? Integral, you're gonna integrate from the end of inflation, dt tilde, okay? This whole expression, okay? A by A E power minus six alpha minus four, okay? E power minus two alpha gamma phi T tilde minus T. This is what it is. This is the formal. It's just a formal integral of that, nothing more, okay? And if you, you can plug that in, okay? If you plug that in for rho, okay? I'm just gonna write this final expression here. I will write it below here so that it is complete. 
So you obtain rho r of t to be, okay, rho phi of e, 2 alpha gamma phi, right? A by A E power minus 4, integral D T tilde, A T tilde, divided by A E power 4 minus 6 alpha into E power minus 2 alpha gamma phi, okay? T tilde minus T, okay? This is what you have. And what is interesting to plot is, you know, quantities like, you know, uh, you should plot omega r, which is rho r by rho r plus rho phi and omega phi, okay, uh, you can, which is, you know, is rho r plus rho phi. And you will find that, you know, if you plot omega phi, Okay, this will be dominant, it's one, right? It'll come down and go like that, okay? And uh, omega r will be small or negligible, and then it'll grow and dominate like that, okay? And this is one, okay? This is omega. And this is where you can say reheating has been achieved when omega r approaches one, okay? Uh, uh, there are, you know, what we have done is that we have treated radiation as a fluid and transferred the energy. Of course, you know, microscopically, there has to be thermalization of the particles and they need to be at the temp at a given temperature, okay? At the desired temperature, rather, okay? But effectively, I'll come to you in a minute, okay? Effectively, you can achieve the transfer of energy. You can even do this with two scalar fields. You can treat... Uh, the, rad the radiation as, a, as another field chi, and you can try to transfer the energy, and that is feasible, okay? But of course, unless you have the specific coupling, we don't know what the inflaton is, and what we want at the end of inflation is all the standard model particles, or possibly beyond standard model particles, to be in thermal equilibrium. In order to achieve that exactly, we need to know the inflaton, and we know, need to know its interaction with the various um, other standard model particles and beyond standard model fields, okay? And when we know them, it should not be difficult to construct a coupling. Of course, whether that coupling can be tested, et cetera, remains to be examined. Yes. That just came, okay. So I erased this, right? There was, uh, okay. Um, it just, I just substituted that expression in the, in the in the in the uh, in the equation for rho r and use this expression nothing more nothing more you look at the expression for rho r dot which i have erased okay it contains you know other than rho r it contains rho phi on the right hand side i just substituted this expression for rho r okay so i think i wrote it as rho r is some a, per, a by a e times uh, correct Right times f of t, okay, and that f of t happens to satisfy this first order differential equation, which I can immediately integrate, okay. People have their own favorite models, okay. There are people who have constructed a variety of models for reheating, okay. But as I was just saying, unless I know the inflaton and what is its specific coupling to the various fields or particles equivalently, okay? Those models have their domain of, you know, limited validity, okay? But what is important is that we have a rough picture in mind, okay? It is possible to couple the fields and transfer the energy from one to another. That seems feasible. Stand no, we don't know, right? I haven't said what is the stand. I have just called it radiation as a fluid, okay? I haven't tried to, in principle, I can couple to one of the fields and transfer, okay? I don't know whether the couplings can be physical that are measured already, et cetera. I'm not able to comment about it offhand, but in principle, I should be able to transfer. If, I, if I'm allowed to freedom with the coupling, I should be able to transfer the energy, okay? That's the picture we have. How it thermalizes, okay? 
uh, you know, uh, it's not only the transfer of energy, it has to be thermal at this time. Okay, yes, that it means, you know, in this case, since we have by hand assumed it to be radiation, it will have this behavior. But microscopically, if you're asking, they have to thermalize, come to equilibrium, and those require interaction between the standard model particles as well. Okay, and those uh, details remain to be worked out. Okay, all right. So now, um, what we have learned is that effectively we can describe um, uh, describe the uh, um, period post inflation through an equation of state, which I've called as W phi. Hereafter, I will refer to as W R E, referring to the equation of state during reheating. And uh, here, let us say it thermalizes. There is a row of R. If it is thermal, okay, according to the Stefan Boltzmann's law, it will be proportional to T power 4, which means there is a reheating temperature that I can associate with it, okay? So the equation, I'm sorry, the period of reheating is for simplicity, we are going to represent, describe in terms of some WRE effectively, okay? And at TRE, and what will happen is that there will be a duration of the reheating as well, but not all three parameters are independent, okay? They will be related to each other as we will see over the next 30, 20 minutes. One of the quantities we would like to know is, you know, what is this, how long is the epoch of reheating, okay? So let me get open my notes. Just give me a minute. Right. So describing the epoch of reheating. I have indicated how reheating occurs, okay? What we are going to do is that we are going to describe this epoch of reheating through its equation of state, okay? Equation of state parameter to be precise, okay? And then we will also require what is known as the reheating temperature, the temperature at which the universe has turned to, you know, become radiation dominated, okay? And there will be a duration of NRE, but if we know WRE, we will see, you know, from the energy density at the end of inflation, we should be able to, you know, relate TRE and NRE, okay? We will see that as we proceed. So I'm going to do some simple algebra. So I'm going to consider this quantity. K is some, uh, uh, some scale, K by A not to be precise, is some scale I'm interested in, okay? And remember, during inflation, it leaves the Hubble radius at some, when the scale factor is AK, and the Hubble radius is, uh, uh, or rather, Hubble scale is HK, okay? A naught, H naught. But the point is that this leaves during inflation, right? So if I have to draw this picture, let me draw this here. So what do you have? You have this Hubble radius during inflation, I do not know what is its behavior during reheating. It is de depends on the equation of state. And then you have a behavior during radiation domination. Okay, let me draw it. Okay, and you have a behavior like that during radiation domination. Okay, this has to be at least one. Okay, something like that. Okay, and this is the epoch of reheating. This is the epoch of reheating. This is inflation. And this is radiation domination. Okay, I'll draw it like that during radiation domination, okay? And if I want to know when this mode left the Hubble radius and when, to re when it re-entered the Hubble radius, et cetera, you know, evidently the duration of reheating and the manner of and WRE, okay, will play a role. So I'm going to introduce, I can write this in the following manner. I can write this as AK by AE. AE is the end of inflation. Scale factor at the end of inflation. ARE is the scale factor at the end of reheating. ARE by AEQ. AEQ is the uh, scale factor at the epoch of equality. AEQ by A0, right? So I've just written AK by A0 in this fashion, nothing more, okay? And then I write HK by HEQ 
and H E Q by H E. Okay, right? And I can write this as um, A K by A E is what we call as, what do we call this as? Do you recall? It's what we call as E power minus N K, right? A K is the time when the mode left the Hubble radius. A E is the scale factor, or rather the scale factor when the mode left the Hubble radius. And A E is the scale factor at the end of inflation. And therefore, you know, that is just E power minus N K. And similarly, I can write this quantity as E power minus N R E, right? And I can write this as E power minus N radiation. This is the duration of radiation domination and so on. And therefore, what do I have? Okay, I have the following. So let me just rush through this because it is not difficult to understand. Just simple algebra. So what do I have? I can write this as, okay. So log of K by A naught H naught, right, is what? minus nk from this expression, minus nre, minus n radiation, right? Plus the remaining term, okay? Log of, okay, um, aeq, heq, right? I've just combined some, this guys, a naught, h naught, okay? Uh, a, a e q h e q a naught h naught and then plus log of what is it it is just h k by h e q all right okay now there are a few things i need to um, um, i need to introduce here all right so keep this expression we'll come to that so, PT is RAS. I'm going to, you know, and therefore, remember, what is PT? PT is, uh, if you recall, 2 HK squared by pi squared MPL squared. Okay? So, that is RAS. Therefore, HK, I hope you understand, we are considering the simple case of slow roll inflation, and we are focusing on the value at... Uh, a particular scale, say the pivot scale, okay? So HK is what? Root a a R A S by two into pi MPL, okay? So I can substitute this here, for instance, okay? And we know the value of A S, yeah? What's the question? No, I have absorbed H naught here, right? I have absorbed H naught here. Okay, it's H. So I have kept H E Q. All right. Um, so it is. No, I have taken A naught H naught, right, and A E Q, and uh, A E Q and H E Q, A E Q H E Q A naught H naught. So I'm left with this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, what else do I want? I want the following, okay? So x squared equal to one over three MPL squared, right? Pi dot squared by two plus three, okay? All right? And you can write this, I will let you work it out from this equation. You can write rho to be, okay? Three by three minus epsilon one into V. This is an identity, okay? This is just an identity, all right? It's just that, you know, uh, remember, epsilon 1 is pi dot squared by 2 x squared MPL squared, okay? You can plug this in, okay, and rewrite the expression, yeah? Okay, so I'm leaving this as an exercise. It's straightforward. So at the end of inflation, right, at the end of inflation, what do I have? I have row end equal to three by two Vn. Okay. 
So in other words, if I have an inflationary potential, say I have an alpha attractor model, okay? I know rho n, okay? Right. So there is another thing I need. I need this relation. S A Q is a constant. Okay. I will explain what that is. You know the first law of the you know thermodynamics. What is that? T D S is equal to D E right plus P D V. Okay. In an expanding universe, right? What is this? It is rho a q, right? What is this? This is s time a q. S is the entropy. Density, I'm multiplying by volume, okay? What is dv? This is d a q. Let's consider this, right? So d rho a q plus p d a q, okay? What is this? This is d rho a q plus 3a square da, correct, rho plus 3a square da p. If I pull out a, a cube, this is d rho plus 3a square a cubed. No, 3 uh, da by a into rho plus p. Okay, what is this? This is nothing but conservation of energy. So this is zero. So what do you have? You have ds is nearly zero, okay, in, a, um, in an expanding universe, okay? Or rather, ds is zero. So s a cubed, s is the entropy density is a constant. Okay, that's the result I've quoted here. Is that clear? Okay, so I haven't, you know, I should do it properly. I should uh, take into account, um, you have collections of bosons and fermions. You need to write down the energy pressure and the entropy density associated with that. And they also have chemical potential. I need to account for them, etc. In the limit when that chemical potential can be ignored, etc., you have the entropy conservation. So I have sort of cheated by, you know, using this first law of thermodynamics. I have to establish that that is valid and that is valid under certain condition. When that is valid, the entropy is conserved. That's what is of our interest. Okay. Now the entropy, we, what do we mean by the entropy? We are talking about the entropy associated with thermal radiation in the early universe, okay? And the thermal radiation, as we just discussed, consists of collections of various particles, okay? And what does it imply? What does it mean to say entropy is conserved, okay? So what you have is as follows, okay? You can show that the entropy is rho plus p by t, okay? Where rho plus p is, um, is, um, is, um, uh, is the energy, uh, and the pressure, energy density and pressure associated with all the particles that are present, okay? And so at the end of reheating at ARE, okay, what will be SA cubed, okay, will be, all right, will be equal to, you can show this, you have to consider some collection of particles, okay, bosons and fermions. I will comment about this in a matter of time, okay? T R E cubed A R E Q. Okay. So where does this arise? Okay. You know, if I have extreme relativistic particles, rho and p are proportional to each other. Okay. And you may have shown that, you know, rho for a thermal distribution, you know, is pi squared by 30 some g times t power 4. What is G? G is the number of degrees of freedom associated with the particle. But G is two for the case of photons, all right? But if you have a fermions, there is another factor of seven by eight that arises. You should show this, okay? And there's a good discussion in Colburn Turner, for instance, okay? Uh, but it is just a number, overall number, 
as you can imagine, if you have relativistic particles, this be t power four divided by t is t cubed. So S A cube in, in constant implies, you know, t a t cubed a cubed is a constant, but t does not exactly fall as one over a. The reason being various particles become non-relativistic at different times. We are assuming that this contribution arises due to relativistic particles. Most of these particles will have masses, okay? When the temperature is high, they will be relativistic. At smaller and at smaller and smaller temperatures, less and less particles will be relativistic, will remain relativistic. And therefore this G changes and the change in G can in principle change, you know, um, it is G times TRE, I'm sorry, G times, which is a function of temperature, okay, times T times A, which is uh, T cubed times A cubed, which is actually conserved, okay? And uh, in fact, if you recall in one of the earlier lectures, I promised to derive the today's neutrino temperature, okay? And I will just make a remark about this in a, in a minute or two, okay? Uh, and, uh, and we'll get back to the calculation concerning reheating. And that is arrived at by demanding conservation of entropy, nothing more. And there is a, another subtle point. There are different Gs that will appear, okay? Remember, the energy density is a sum of, you know, um, uh, energy densities of bosons and fermions, all right? And the whether your boson, for instance, if you have photons, it ha they have two degrees of freedom corresponding to do two degrees of polarization. If you have fermions, there is a factor of seven by eight comes about. It is T power four, but there's an overall factor of seven by eight comes about, okay? Prove that if you're not familiar with it, okay? In proportional to T power four, okay? Those have to be accounted for as well, all right? So there is a G that will appear, number of degrees of freedom, okay? For the case of energy density, and there will be another G that will appear for the case of entropy density. Okay, and they will differ slightly, you need to be careful, but they will be roughly similar for, you know, rough calculations, I'm going to ignore the differences. So I will be a little careless about the G subscript S versus just G, which corresponds to uh, the energy density. Okay, so as I said, this is a good time to uh, discuss what happens to the neutrino temperature. The idea is simple, and then I'll come back to radiation. I may need some of these expressions. So let me see whether I can write it here itself. So this is something I have already mentioned. So what essentially happens is as follows. There is a neutrino decoupling that takes place at, you know, temperatures of one MeV or higher, okay? And until then, all the, uh, all the species are at the same temperature, okay? And once the neutrino decoupling takes place, they are, you know, the amazing thing about uh, when they are in equilibrium, they are at the temperature of the bath. When they are decoupled, they are at the, you know, um, uh, they will have their own temperature and fall as one over eight thereafter. Okay. And what happens at 0.5 MeV or so, nearly 0.5 MeV, can you make a guess? As I just mentioned, E plus and E minus cease to be relativistic. So they stop contributing to the entropy, okay, number one. And what essentially happens, you can imagine is as follows. Um, so until this point, during this epoch, the photons and the neutrinos have the same temperature. But imagine what happens after this epoch, okay? The E plus E minus can combine to produce two photons, but it cannot happen the other way around. So there is more and more energy being pumped into photons, so you expect the photons to be having a slightly higher temperature than the neutrinos, okay? And this is the only, this is the argument, and the, and the factor that I have talked about comes about due to the following reason, okay? So let me see whether I can, so prior to, uh, prior to this, okay, the electrons, positrons, and the photons are at are relativistic, okay? So what do I have? I have two, let me get my notes to get the, all the factors correct. Right. So what do I have? I have, let 
Just bear with me. Okay, I have to estimate this. I'm going to erase this for now. Okay, what do I have? I have prior to this, uh, S is equal to G before, okay? Uh, T before, A before, Q, okay? And G after, T after Q, A after Q. This is what it is, okay? But what happens is that the... Um, so this contains, before contains, what do I have? I have two degrees of freedom associated with the photons, okay? And then I have T, um, the neutrinos and the, uh, and the photons are at the same temperature at that time, okay? So I have T before, A before, okay? Cubed, okay? Plus a factor of, Okay, I can pull this out overall. T before A before cubed, right? Into, what do I have? Two plus the two of the um, two degrees of freedom associated with electrons and positrons. It's S is equal to half. Two into half plus one is two. Okay, so it's two into two into seven by eight. And seven by eight arises because they are fermions. Okay, so what is this? This is, help me out. This is by two. So this is 11 by two. Is that correct? It's 11 by two. And that is equal to, after this, only the photons remain. Okay, so what do I have? I have two times Ta after a whole Q. So, in other words, TB, AB, whole cube, divided by TA, AA, whole cube is 11 by 4. If I take the ratio, one third. This is the point. Okay? So, what happens is that the neutrinos decouple, that temperatures fall as 1 over A. When after this, the photon's temperature falls as 1 over A. But after this epoch, the neutrino temperature and the photon temperature, so I hope it's clear, T before, there is a neutrino temperature and there is a photon temperature, but they are the same at that epoch. And the neutrinos have a certain temperature which goes down. So I will call this new. And this essentially is here. This is the photon temperature. I'll call it gamma. Okay? So at any later epoch, it falls as, you know, in this fashion, okay? But it is at any time that temperature, ratio of those temperatures will be given by a factor of 11 by 4 power one third. Let me explain. So have I made a mistake? That's right. T, B, A, B, R. That's right. Minus one third. Thank you. Okay. So the neutrino temperature is below the photon temperature after this epoch by a factor of 4 by 11 power one third, okay? And they maintain this ratio. For instance, today, the temperature, if T naught, if T gamma is, um, is, uh, is 2.725, 4 by 11 power one third times 2.725 is something like 1.9 odd Kelvin, okay? So that's the neutrino temperature, and we have arrived at it from from the um, uh, conservation of entropy. And the picture one has is that post this epoch, right, there is electrons and positrons which are converting into photons, but the process, the other way, the process cannot occur because there is not enough energy in the photons on the average. And therefore, they push the CMB temperature up. During this window, the temperature of the CMB and the temperature of the photons are the same. Okay, so thereafter, the temperature keeps. The photon temperature falls as 1 over A here, and from here onwards, the neutrino temperature falls as 1 over A. That's why this product appears here. Okay, I hope that is clear. All right, are there any questions? Okay, 
So we should, let's get back to where we left off, right? Let's get back to where we left off. So, now it's a matter of, you know, what we need to do is relate TRE to T naught. Me. Sorry, just uh, right. Okay, so we were at this point. S A cubed is a constant. Okay, and if you use this, all right. And conservation of entropy, okay? And I'm going to leave this as an exercise because I had to spend a few minutes on that. So you can show from the conservation of entropy is this. 43 by 11 GS comma RE times power one third A naught by ARE. Right? You expect, you know, barring these factors, right? which occur because of the fact, you know, you need to account for both the entropy in the neutrinos and the entropy in the photon today, okay? And that leads to this 43 by 11. I will let you work that out. And you can, this is not surprising, right? TRE is one over ARE. That's what it is. And this arises because of, you can arrive at it from conservation of entropy, okay? If there was no change in G at all, number of relativistic degrees of freedom, effective relativistic degrees of freedom, this number would have been unity, okay? And this factor arises because of two reasons, that at late times, you have a contribution due to neutrinos and photons, and you know the relation between the, this is the photon temperature. You know the relation between the neutrino temperature and the photon temperature, as I have just derived, and you can arrive at this. I will leave it as an exercise for you to do. Okay. So you plug that all in, okay? So what have I got now? K by, right? So just bear with me. So I can write, you know, um, just, so you can write, okay, this as, you can write TRE, okay, eventually as follows, okay, 43 by 11, this quantity, GSRE. I'm just writing a couple of intermediate steps, A naught, T naught by K, all right, HK, all right, E power minus NK minus NRE, all right, okay. And essentially, what you do is that you substitute all these expressions. I haven't done justice to the, you know, deriving the result, okay? Um, so you use this expression. I will try to explain what I'm arriving at because I need an expression and I'm running out of time. Okay, what you can do is the following. NRE happens to be, I'm just substituting that expression. 4 by WRE minus 1, okay, 3 WRE minus 1. I'll give you a reference where this is discussed. Hopefully that will, okay. Final expression is K by A naught T naught, okay, plus 1 over 4 log 30 by pi square GRE, okay. Minus what I'm, I need to do is that I need to take, you know, um, HK, for instance, and substitute in the expression that earlier, that I had earlier. Okay. All right. Minus one third log 43 divided by 11 GS comma RE minus log HK by rho N over one fourth. This is the expression in principle you will be able to obtain. Okay. Um, okay. There is, um, 
Uh, now, you may wonder how this arose. This arose in the following fashion. I will. So what you need to do is the following. Um, you have at the end of reheating, remember, so at the start of the radiation domination era, what will you have? You will have um, 2 pi squared by 45. I hope I get the GRE times TRE for 4. Okay? At the start of the radiation dominated era or at the end of the reheating era. Okay? Now, you have this expression for TRE. Okay? And then, what do you... Um, and you have the other expression, which is rho RE is rho end. That's what this is. Times what? E power minus 3 into 1 plus W R E N R T. Right? So if you equate them, you will obtain a relation between something like N R E and T R E. Okay? Is that clear? Okay? And the TR, and when you substitute that, you arrive at this relation here. This is the final result you need to arrive at. Okay. The bottom line is the following. Okay. I really don't have time to explain everything. Uh, you have, you are just integrating, I'm sorry, dealing with the background equations to arrive at this. Okay. If, let us say, I know R and NS. Okay. Let, I, let us say I know R and NS, okay? You have a, and you have a given inflationary um, model, okay? And what it means is that you can, you know HK, okay? You know um, rho N, okay? And, and if you know these values, and you know that this is a typical scale, pivot scale, K by A naught, you know what is T naught, okay? And therefore, in prince, and given an inflationary model, if you know NS, for instance, you take the five power N model, okay? Remember, we arrived that in terms of NK. In, even in the Starobinsky model, we did that, okay? So if you, if you know NS, let us say, okay, and R, and what essentially happens is that R D demands HK, and NK is D demand from NS, okay? And you know, you know, rho end, and therefore, you know something like NRE or WRE, okay? And if you don't have any models in mind, okay, what you can do is that you can essentially arrive at constraints on, you know, there is a relation between TR, as I said, the epoch of reheating is described by these parameters, TRE, WRE, and NRE, but they are not independent, okay? You can arrive at a relation between them. So essentially, you are interested in two quantities. You would like to know, for instance, what is WRE and say TRE or NRE, one of them. What I'm trying to say is that using observations, you can put bounds on the epoch of reheating. Okay. You know, of course, you will need to consider specific inflationary models. Okay. Otherwise, everything is not everything is known. And okay. So if you have a specific inflationary model, you will know NK, for instance. Okay, and therefore you can constrain something like WRE or NRE. Okay, and this is an, you know, people have written papers on these topics about how, you know, um, given an inflationary model, you will be able to constrain, you know, epochs of, uh, you know, parameters that describe the epoch of reheating. Yes, Doug. Is this NRE expression well defined for omega RE being one third? Uh, no, no, it's not. It's not, but then there is no reheating, right? But if I set omega RE equal to one third, I expect NRE to go to zero. Zero, right? yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, I, I have to think about what happens in that uh, limit, okay? I'm not able to comment immediately. Yes, yes, this is, uh, um, uh, look, WRE equal to um, uh, one third corresponds to NRE becoming zero, as you said, okay? Um, it is, and now I need to check what essentially happens. There is, um, 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 I need to, I need to check what happens in that limit. Okay, uh, okay. Let's let's ignore that for a minute. Okay, and the bottom line is that if you have, in principle, the constraints already that you have an R and NS will determine what is it. It will determine both these quantities, 
and it will determine this quantity. And therefore, you know, you can arrive at constraints on, uh, you know, uh, some combination of WRE and NRE or equivalently WRE and TRE. And also the second term in the first line, is it dimensionally correct? The arguments of logarithm, is it dimensionally correct? K by Yeah, yeah, I, T. I understand your concern. Uh, it, there is no issue, right? K is dimensions of energy, so is T. So we are not measuring K in megaparsecs here. Megaparsec so, uh, you can convert that into T naught into okay. megaparsec. I have a number. So there is there. a conversion factor. Yeah, yeah. Crucial. But those are all, you, you know, you okay. just H bar C and KB. Right? Okay. Nothing more. And which are all have been set to unity. Okay. So again, I haven't just done justice to, you know, um, the intermediate steps. I have simply run out of time. Okay. But uh, um, uh, what essentially it's as follows um, is that you can arrive at this relation between NRE and, you know, and uh, rather, let me state it differently. You can arrive at this relation between parameters which characterize the epoch of inflation and parameters that characterize the epoch of reheating. That's the bottom line here, okay? So what do we have here? We have WRE and NRE, which parameterize the epoch of reheating. So in either, if you work with a specific inflationary model, then you know all these quantities, okay? The rho N, HK, okay? Of course, you need to assume GRE and GSRE, okay? You can assume to be 10 power two or so, then immediately you have a window in NRE and WRE, which will be consistent with the, um, with the data. Okay. So I wanted to discuss, you know, um, effects of reheating on primary gravitational waves. All right. Uh, I have simply run out of time. In the afternoon, uh, I have this challenge of discussing three topics, um, uh, primary gravitational waves, PBH formation, and secondary gravitational waves. Uh, I will just outline how it's done, okay? The primary gravitational waves is relatively simple to understand. So is PBH formation. Secondary gravitational waves is a little more involved. I will outline, and then I will point to uh, um, recent uh, reviews, which discuss it extensively. Thank you, Raga. Just two questions. Can we take now, or can we... Yes, we it? can answer now, yeah. Uh, would you please explain how the first law of thermodynamics is valid if the system is not in equilibrium? Who said, you know, they are in thermal equilibrium, right? So we're talking about instantan... relativistic fluids and thermal equilibrium. So instantaneous thermalization takes care of it. That's what... There is, they are in thermal equilibrium. Okay. Okay, that's the assumption, right? When we have a radiation-dominated universe, we are thinking of collections of particles which are in thermal equilibrium, and all of them having the same temperature at very early epochs. Okay, another question is a bit long. G star being 7 by 8, uh, calculating takes the relativistic degrees of neutrinos and antineutrinos to be 1 as they are just left-handed. So can we see this temperature that neutrinos would only be left-handed? So does this give a tight constraint on extension of standard models? Say SO10 group, etc. Okay, I am not able to say this. Uh, I haven't discussed that at all, okay? Uh, what I have said is that, you know, uh, I, I haven't, what I have done is that I have just taken the change in the number of degrees of freedom, uh, which are relativistic across this 0.5 MeV transition to arrive at the relation between the neutrino temperatures. Because prior to this, I am just using the word neutrino temperature, but prior to this, neutrino and all other particles are at the same temperature. Okay, that allows me to arrive at a relation between the neutrino temperature and the uh, and the photon temperature. That was my goal. I am not able to answer that question. I need to look at uh, and answer. Yeah. Thank you.